Have you guys ever heard of survivorship bias? I've heard it's actually kind of interesting. And it's related to World War II. Maybe you guys would be into it. Survivor bias. Maybe we we'll watch one of these two videos. Just have a look at this image for a second. And I want to tell you the story behind the image. Okay. Um, this is an image from... So... Once upon a time, Feedback Gaming used to be a debate bro. That's right, I used to go into people's Discord, see people talk about politics and debate them. And for the most part, I wasn't a very nice person. And for the most part, I have a little bit of regret of how I behaved back, back in the day. I think for the most part, when you're constantly on the hunt, looking for a fight, looking for an argument, you come across like a very negative person. And I think it's something you never really want to do. In my mind, I was doing a good thing because I was trying to... Uh, broaden my political horizon. Because I feel like your idea is never as good... Uh, as in, unless you bring them to debate because how do how good do you know your ideas to be until you actually talk about them out loud with someone and, and they challenge you on your ideas anyway besides the point that was me back in the day so i was quite obsessed with uh logical fallacies logical fallacies Is there any, have you guys ever seen this chart i popped this on my discord a while back here we go so, is survivorship bias on here? No, it's not. So, survivorship bias is where you believe that because you succeeded, you believe anyone else can do this. So it's the idea that your success can be replicated and copied over and over again. So, for instance, let's say you were poor at some stage in your life, and you manage to get a job and work your way up in the company and you manage to succeed and you now are sitting on a wealthy amount of money and a nice house and a mortgage and a beautiful wife and you said to yourself i could do this too anyone can do this look i survived so therefore you can do it too the reason why it's a fallacy is you can fall into the trap of believing that your circumstances are equal to somebody else's when um, you can get fall into the trap of that everyone's circumstances are individually different. For instance, if my skin color wasn't white, there would be a possibility that I wouldn't be taken as seriously based on certain attributes. Uh, I'm not going to go into racial things, but you get the idea. Let's say I, let's say I speak with an accent. I've got I've got basically a European accent, and people maybe don't take me as seriously as someone who sees me as an English speaker first, for instance. So therefore, it could hold me back in my ability to build rapport with people, and therefore help my ability to progress in my career. Just an example, random example. Maybe maybe if I have a disability, a lisp. If I speak with a lisp. And I'm not very confident because of the lisp. People don't take me as a seriously. But that doesn't mean I don't have the concept, have the potential to gain certain skills that anyone else gains. Just because they hear a lisp in my voice, potentially that could hold back my potential for career. So therefore, my chance of succeeding isn't as high. Hence, survivorship bias. Is that the correct definition? There's a part of me that doesn't agree with that. Let's see if that's true. World War II. Um, it's from the U.S. I was about to say U.S. Army. It's from the U.S. Air Force, obviously. Okay. Um, and what it is, is a rough representation of some data. Some bivalent data, you might say, that was collected data. from the aircraft the best of the U.S. Air Force. Would anyone like to have a guess what this data represents? Parent, what do you think? Bullets is a very good guess. Does anyone want to be a little more specific? Sean. I was going to say icing on the plate. What? <laughs> icing on the plate. Icing on the... Oh, oh ice forming like when you play... Yeah, okay. Someone needs to put their hand up and go, it represents Hoi 4 Strategy Bombers 3. Yeah, sure, sure. I'm... <laughs> I'm going to go with bullets. Okay. Strategic bombing um, level three, boys. These are places where uh, there were, you know, bullet damage found on aircraft returning to the U.S. Air Force. Now, when you're designing fighter or bomber aircraft like they were in the Second World War, um, you kind of have this tension between two different things, right? You want your aircraft to be armoured. You want to protect your aircraft because then they'll come back, right? And that's that's really good. But you don't want to arm. Please come back, armor. aircraft. Because then you can't fly, right? Um, you can't take off. You have less range, so you can't uh, go to a further target or things like that, right? So you want enough armor, but not too much. So they gathered some data to try and help them work out, well, can I put more armor on some areas and less armor on others? Now, when you have a look at this, I want you to think about what conclusion the aircraft designers would have made when they had a look 
at all their aircraft and where they got shot, where do you think they should put the armor? So this is this is what we call the fuselage, right? You got the wings, you got um mobilized voice back here. Okay. So I, I heard someone say put it in the middle. Oh, in the middle. Put it where the red dots are. That's a really good yes, that's right. Does anyone agree? Put it where the red dots are. Hands up. I disagree. I, I Sophie is a dissenting opinion. I'll come to that in a second. I want to clear a show of hands. Who said put the it where the red dots are? The peer pressure and to put their hands up. Yeah. Okay, so I'm getting like half of you. Okay, um, Sophie disagrees. Why do you disagree? Okay. She already knows. So think about it. If the plane comes back and it's had some bullets. Okay, okay. Um, I, I just, I just real. I just want to revise what I previously just said. Um, yeah. So the reason why survivorship bias is, is a fallacy is because we, if we want to look on how people succeed, we need to look at the losers, not the winners which you will see very soon why with this um, video. We have to look at the losers, not the winners. We're doing so well. Okay, let me, let me see if I can summarize. Let me see if I can summarize. So, so there is suspiciously, there's suspiciously no gunfire recorded on the cockpit. We could do this on a daily basis. We can make like a video on each bias and see if we can like analyze it and like understand why we fall into it and how to overcome it. I think that'd be a really cool idea. I, I would learn a lot from that too. None. None on the engines or on this very particularly fragile part of the aircraft where it's very, very thin. Why is that? You get shot in any of these places, you don't come back to be a data point. Does that make sense? Right? Pilot doesn't survive. Okay, now, that's actually exactly the right. Moe, did you want to add another point? Hmm. So placing armor where the dots aren't, actually what these dots suggest is, here's where your aircraft can be shot and still make it back to base. Does that make sense? Which is kind of counterintuitive, right? Well, okay, now, actually, Sarang's asked a really good question and I want to push on it because that's why this conclusion is so weird and counterintuitive. Sarang said, isn't this where planes got shot? And the answer is yes, but this isn't a complete picture, is it? Because in fact, planes get shot all over. Planes get shot all over. But if you get shot in these other areas, we never get that information. Does that make sense? <laughs> so we have a name for this, right? We have a name for this, and this is worth jotting down, by the way, under the, um, <laughs> it clicked for you, okay, very good. Um, if you want to make a little, <clears throat> excuse me, a little subheading. Hello. Which is called bias. Uh, we wouldn't normally think of this as an issue of bias. We normally think, oh, you're biased towards a kind of person or a kind of team or whatever, right? This particular bias is called survivorship bias. And the story of the person in World War II yes. who discovered it, a guy named Abraham Wald, it's in your booklet. It's there. It's just It was a Hungarian kind of like, Why would we not include the picture? Jew. More feedback for the next version of this book. Jewish man. So... This is not the only form of bias that sneaks into data. For example, if you do a survey of people... I'm biased right, towards Dave. Um, you don't get Says you non-sub. You only get information from the people who fill out the survey. And sometimes that will bias you towards hearing from particular kinds of people. For example... Bias you? Restaurant reviews. Restaurant reviews, right? Classically, you've got... Remember I talked about this... Um, this gap in the data in here, this is a classic thing that you see on restaurant reviews. Why do you think that is? Think about this. Well, people either read the restaurants they really loved it or really hated it, but if it was average, it's like, you know, it's like it, yeah, very good. People only rate if they're like, I had an amazing experience or I felt sick, it was terrible, the service was awful. If you're kind of here in the middle, you just kind of meh. Our Air Force is getting really big now. I'm kind of worried though because I mean it gets so big that to spend time to fill out a survey. I might not have enough airports. The, um, the voluntary bias, right? Because it's a volunteer thing. You don't get that all of the information there. There's many different forms of bias. You what am I doing, chat? Spare. I'm playing Holy Four, bro. I'm listening to some YouTube on, videos. Chill, chill, bro. Get a sense of what this is talking about and chill, what data is relevant to it. Okay. 
Okay, in this video, oh, no, wrong one. No, not that one. Welcome to the Bukshan district of Seoul, South Korea. It is here where you can find some traditional Korean architecture, these really impressive roofs. And looking at these buildings, it might be natural to conclude that, well, they just don't make them like they used to. That in the old days, we used to build with much better quality. But there is a question of, is that really true? Because we're not looking at all the homes that existed back then. Ooh, we're this is probably going to be good. select subset, that group that has survived to the present day. So you would say that it'd be pretty logical that these homes would be the best built and the best maintained, so they don't really give you an idea of the way things were built. And we get that same impression for a lot of things. So this is known as the survivor bias, and it comes into play with a lot of our reasoning where we're looking at samples which are not complete. The classic example of survivor bias comes from World War II, when the British were losing so many bomber aircraft when they flew over occupied territory. They were shot down so often that the British decided something needed to be done. They needed to add armor to these aircraft. But of course, they couldn't just add armor all over armor the aircraft, aircraft that would madness. make these planes a lot heavier, and then that would inhibit their ability to fly out uh, and get to their targets. So they could only add armor to select areas of the craft where that would provide the greatest benefit. So they did a survey of all the planes that had come back and they noted down where those planes had been shot. And then the thinking was, we just add the armor there where the planes are getting shot and that should help protect more planes. Of course, this is a terrible idea because the aircraft that you're looking at are the survivors. They're the ones who have made it back to you. It's the ones that you don't see. Those are the ones whose hits you need to protect against. But, but how are you to know where those aircraft were hit because you never get to see them again? Well, the answer is, you kind of assume that the aircraft are getting hit randomly, and so the ones that are coming back to you are getting hit in places that are not vital, that, that don't cause them to crash. So the places where they're not getting hit are the places that need the armor. It seems counterintuitive if you're not thinking about survivor bias, but of course, once you realize that you're looking at a very selective surviving subset, it is quite obvious that you need to protect the places on the planes, the survivors that are coming back uh, unharmed, because those are the critical areas of the plane. Damn. There was another study published in 1987 about cats falling from high-rise buildings in New York City. Apparently that was a pretty common thing, which makes sense. A lot of high-rise buildings, a lot of cats. In fact, there were so many that scientists could do statistical analysis on how bad the cat's injuries were depending on which floor they fell from. Now, what was found was basically what you'd expect. The higher up they fell, uh, the worse their injuries. So falling from the sixth floor was worse than falling from the third floor. Totally makes sense. But here's where it gets weird. Beyond but they were only assessing the ones with injuries. They weren't assessing the ones that had died. That's what he's going to tell us now. The seventh floor, the injuries actually decreased. They decreased a lot. So it was actually better for a cat, say, to fall from a 20th story than from the sixth story. Now, that doesn't really seem to make sense. But scientists hypothesized that what was happening was that cats take about five or six stories to reach terminal velocity. That speed where they're no longer accelerating because their drag, the air resistance, is equal to their weight. And so beyond that, they're not speeding up anymore, and in fact, they can relax. So if they fall from 10 or 15 stories, they've got some time to relax after reaching terminal velocity, and the theory goes, uh, they land nicely and they bounce and they don't suffer as many injuries as if they fell from a lower height and they were still kind of accelerating as they went into the ground. Now, this theory might be true or might have a bit of truth in it, but survivor bias may also come into play here. Because, of course, if a cat fell from, say, 20 stories and turned out to be just a splat on the pavement, it would never have made it into the emergency rooms where these statistics were collected. So yet again, we have this clear bias in the data. It would only be cats that had really survived their fall from a high height that would make their way into the data. But survivor bias is not just this little quizzical statistical oddity. I think it also has important implications for how we live our lives. For example, a lot gets written about how people like Steve Jobs or Bill Gates or the guy who founded Dell, uh, how they dropped out of college. And then this is suggested as... Oh, yeah. So that's a classic line people always use. They always say, why do I need to stay on at college or university and go to higher education when Bill Gates and Zuckerberg dropped out of college? Well, that's survivorship bias, isn't it? You're looking at the subset of survivors and the ones that have achieved, when that doesn't really give a... You don't have to look at the... You have to look at the big picture. You don't look at the winners. You look at the losers. Why don't the winners achieve? 
why don't the losers achieve? You know, something that really bright young uh, people should do. They should drop out of college because only there, with your drive and your passion, you know, you can make it make it work. You don't need a college education, right? That's basically the message of these successful people. But of course, what that excludes is all the people who dropped out of college and weren't very successful. And in fact, if you do look at the entire sample, you find the people who stay in college are much more successful. They make more money and they uh, seem to lead more successful lives. They're less likely to default on loans. So when we start collecting up people who win and then trying to find commonalities, we often get into trouble. Uh, there was a guy who wrote a book called Good to Great, where he identified uh, 11 great companies based on their performance over 40 years on the stock market. They had outperformed the market over 40 years. Now, the thing is, after the publication of his book, people have tracked how successful those companies were, and six of them, six of the 11 in the following 10 years, underperformed the market. So the point being that this way, this kind of hindsight bias of, of looking at who's been successful to this day may not really reveal the quality of that thing that you're looking at. It may reveal a little bit about luck. The most troubling aspect of survivor bias hit me one day when I was discussing the fairness or otherwise of life. I mean, is it really a meritocracy where those with the greatest skills and work ethic end up being the most successful? My friend said he felt like it was, that to him the world was fair. And it was then that I realized this is another one of those survivor bias phenomenons. It's only because you're successful, because you survived, that the world seems fair. And if you had worked equally hard and just not got any Oh, God, yeah. Just, then the world would feel much more unfair. But of course, it's those people who are successful who can tell themselves that story, that their outcome is the result of their hard work, their ingenuity, uh, their perseverance, and maybe to a degree, it is. But also, maybe to a degree, there is luck in there. And for other people who work just as hard, they have less luck, and they end up on the downside of, of fortune. And of course, it's the people who are successful who then get to make the rules. They have all the resources, they get the influence, and what do they say about people who aren't successful? Do they attribute it to luck? Or are they more likely to just say, no, success comes down to the hard work that we put in? That's maybe the worst result of survivor bias. It's the survivors who get to make the rules. Ah, oh, man, that was really, really fascinating. Those examples were really good. So th th this... You see this quite often when people will say something like, I did it, I achieved it, I pushed through and persevered, so therefore anyone can do it. That is survivorship bias. This idea that you achieved, so therefore anyone can recreate your success. And they use that quite often in those self-help seminars. They always say that anyone can be a millionaire. Look, I'm a millionaire, I'm standing here right before you, so therefore it's possible for me, I'm a loser, so therefore anyone can do it. And then they sell books on the idea of becoming a millionaire to thousands of people <laughs> when, when they don't realize they're falling into a fallacy. It is possible to achieve. It is possible to win. Uh, but you're selling them on a, on a, I guess, on a, on a lie, I suppose. I think we should probably do one more survivorship bias video just to make sure we uh, understand it. Oh, TED Talk. So good, TED Talk. Oh, I used to binge TED Talks. I love them. You know, I love when I get a chance to be up on a stage like this and give a lecture or a speech or something like that because I'm reminded of my favorite kind of lecture or speech, and that is the inspirational speech. It's the one that you usually see at a college commencement, maybe a high school graduation, and what it amounts to is one person giving out one piece of advice to a lot of people all at once. It's very efficient. It's very cool. And usually... The I think self-help people use survivorship bias on purpose. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah, 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 yeah. I think they're completely aware of it. I think a lot of these people, particularly these people who are scammers, I think scammers are particularly intelligent people. I think to... to scam people... I think you've got to be particularly bright and you've got to be aware of what's going on. But you're almost, maybe they're getting stuck in cognitive dissonance uh, that, that they believe that they know they're doing something wrong and they're convincing themselves in their head that it's a good thing. I think that's the only way that something's from going insane. The kind of person that's picked for something like that is a person who has overcome great adversity, uh, great odds, or it's someone who has achieved a certain kind of success, a measure of success that we all like to be able to achieve. And I think that it really illustrates sort of how we seek advice. And we seek advice in a very biased way. We sort of are skewed in the direction of a particular kind of person. And when we do that, we often miss 
what we're missing. And to explain what I mean, I need to tell you a little story, one of my favorite stories in all of psychology. It doesn't really start out as a psychological story, but we'll get there. It starts in 1941 in an apartment complex in New York City, uh, overlooking Morningside Heights, and this is what it looks like today, but it hasn't changed very much since then. Only the uh, cars really have changed. And at the time, people walking around on the street, they couldn't have known that four stories above them, a group of mathematical soldiers were engaged in statistical combat, daily creating equations that would both Why won't they declare war on me? What's happening? Human lives. And the reason for that was because it was war. And war had become more complicated than any one person could ever hope to understand. So many things had just been introduced into the world that were now on the battlefield <coughs> right away. Things like rockets and radar and sonar and submarines and tank divisions and long-range bomber squadrons. Things that had just been unveiled at the World's Fair. We're now cracking that world apart. So no commander could be expected to really absorb the battlefield. And it's obvious to modern minds what these people needed were computers. But a computer in 1941 was a clunky experiment made out of telephone switches and vacuum tubes, and there weren't very many of them. And you might think, well, they could have used calculators, but a calculator in 1941 was sort of a hybrid mix of a typewriter and a cash register, so that's not going to work either. What is great, though, is that they did have all the computers they would ever need. It's just that in 1941, the world's most powerful number crunchers ran on toast and coffee. And they were thrilled to find out that really they had lots and lots of these brainiacs in the United States. From. Many of them had just fled from their homeland during the war. And they gathered all of these people together into 11 different research groups. And these research groups were sort of uh, turned into meat-based mainframes. And these meat-based mainframes, they, um, they each had a different specialty. For instance, this is the uh, Philadelphia computing section. Oops, sorry. Okay. That's the Philadelphia computing section. It's a group of all women mathematicians who all day long, every day, uh, computed ballistics tables by hand. Women. Something that you could probably do today with a desktop computer. And each one of these um, meat-based mainframes, they became sort of leaves on a new branch of the military known as the Department of War Math. Um, which is not true. <laughs> I, I made that up. <clears throat> I just think it would be really, fu really fun and cool and awesome if they were called the Department of War Math. Um, because they were known by this very unsexy 1940s uh, term, the Applied Mathematics Panel. And the Applied Mathematics Panel's job was to sort of serve as like a military-based tech support. So what would happen is that um, a commander in the field would have this problem, couldn't solve it. They would call up the Applied Mathematics Panel and say, hey, can you, uh, can you get me a scientist who can work this out? And then the scientist would work out something that no one ever figured out before. And advancing that field that they worked in, uh, they would later win a Nobel Prize in an effort to advance this uh, combat in a way that would maybe win a war for global control of the planet. So very similar to calling tech support. And the, um, the, the things they worked on, you know about the things they worked on, you've heard of some of these things, code breaking, the atomic bomb, that sort of thing. But one problem they worked on most of all as the war progressed was aircraft survivability. Aircraft survivability is basically trying to make sure that your planes make it home more often than not and the enemy's planes don't. And this was a really pressing problem as the war went on because the chances of a single bomber crew member making it from the beginning of the war to the end of the war was, at the height of the war, basically a coin flip, it was 50-50. So if you could improve the odds of these people by just 1%, maybe 2%, then you could really affect the outcome of the war. Now, they went about this problem like they would anything. They sent it to the Applied Mathematics Panel. They found the group that would work on it. And the group that would work on it was the Statistical Research Group, the SRG. And they worked out of that apartment complex in New York City. And they were headed up by Abraham Wald. And he was uniquely suited to this task because Abraham Wald was the greatest statistician of his day. But he also just escaped the Nazi purge. He was rising to fame in Austria when he escaped. He grew up in Hungary, and his family did not make it. His, uh, many of his family members died in concentration camps. So he was eager to turn his integers and exponents into bombs and bullets. And the way that he did that was that he created all, all sorts of different kinds of analyses and sort of uh, different methods for determining what kind of resistance would a plane get. There's so much political power. I don't know what to do with it. And it was really useful stuff that was still being used today. But in part of his analysis, he did something very simple. And he created cards that are actually simpler than what you see right here. And he passed them out to bomber crews. And he asked the bomber crews that as the planes came in for a landing, could you walk out there and mark where they've been damaged, where they've been shot, where they've been hit by flak, that sort of thing. And over time, when you stack up a bunch of those cards, you get sort of a heat map. And the heat map showed where these planes were receiving the most damage, which was right in the very center, along the tail gunner, and out there on the edges along the wings. Now, this, his analysis, you know, was very complicated, but this was very simple, very easy to understand, very actionable. And the commander saw this as he was putting together his 79. work. 79. We can use this immediately. Because you can't armor an entire airplane like a tank or it won't take off. But you can put it in these places where they've been damaged. And that's what they began to do, is put the armor in these spots. And when Wald heard about this, he said, whoa, 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 stop. That is a huge, stupid mistake. And I imagine that they, you know, they, they bit down on their um, cigars, and they looked at Wald, and they said, what are you talking about? Wald, you did a bang-up job with this analysis, yeah? 
And, he, and what he said to them was like, look, okay, these planes made it home, holes and all, which means that you're looking at where a plane can be damaged and make it back to the base. The planes are strongest where they're being damaged. What you're, what you're worried about are the planes that didn't make it back. You're missing what's missing. They're not even in your analysis. This is always the example they use, don't they? The World War II bombers. Analysis at all. You're skewed in the direction of these survivors. What you need to do is imagine that the planes that didn't get back, that didn't make it home, they were shot where these planes were not. So you need to put the armor... Hey, 1% more animals. world tension. They did, and it was the right decision, and it helped turn the tide of the war. Now, I hope a question bubbles up in your mind when you think about this. If the stakes could have been this high, I mean, we're talking about the fate of the planet, and they were devoted to not making stupid mistakes. I mean, they invented the Department of War Math, right? Then how could they then go ahead and make such a silly and stupid mistake? And could I be making that sort of mistake in my profession or otherwise? And the answer is, yes, you are. Um, you, you make this mistake every day. You've probably made it today. You're probably making it right now. And the reason Wald was able to recognize this is because he was trained in statistics and mathematical analysis, and they know all about something called survivorship bias. Survivorship bias is the human tendency to focus on survivors instead of whatever you would call a non-survivor, depending on the situation. Now, sometimes that could be the living instead of the dead. Sometimes it could be successes instead of failures. Sometimes it could be winners instead of losers. Because in any process that leaves behind oh, non-survivors, those non-survivors are often destroyed or muted or removed from your view. And that means naturally, of course, if all that's left behind are successes, then that's all you'll pay att attention to. You won't even notice the failures. And even though you could learn a great deal. I don't even know if this is going to work. Let's just try. information that's inside the things that are missing. You may not even realize that there's missing information <laughs> at all. Now, there's some really cool examples of this that in our modern life, uh, in everyday life, things that, um, that are a lot simpler that help you understand this. Um, one of my favorites is just log cabins. Right? Give me lend lease. Um, Frontier Log Cabins. There's a photographer I love. His name is Mike Johnson. Oh, that's, that was uh, stupid. He has a blog called The Online Photographer. And he says that he takes pictures of Frontier Log Cabins, and he says when he shows them off to people, they often say to him, wow, look at these log cabins. You know, they, they really don't know uh, how to make things like they used to. And he said, well, what are you, what are you talking about? And I said, well, look at uh, This is the same, the one that the last YouTuber used, isn't it? The idea that buildings that are standing at the moment, the ones that have tested time, so therefore they're the winners. Cabins, they're made out of wood and mud, and they're still standing up for hundreds of years. I mean, we couldn't make something like that with modern materials that we could expect to last that long. And he says, no, you're, you're seeing this all wrong. 99% of all log cabins fell right over. Uh, they didn't survive their first uh, bout with, with harsh weather, or they began to rot right away. I mean, they were made with terrible materials. No, all you can see are the rare few that did survive, and they're misrepresenting the idea of a log cabin to you. You're missing what is missing. Another great example would be the restaurant business. Now, if you live in an area that has a lot of really successful restaurants, I should have gone for propaganda. Hand over fist. You might be sitting there. Oh, but now you're one percent now. I should get into the restaurant business. <laughs> it looks like you really can make a lot of money. I mean, look at this. I don't see a single restaurant in this area that's not making a lot of money. And there's the problem. You're being hit by survivorship bias again because if you see a cluster of super successes, that is evidence for a business you should avoid because they must be super successful to survive in their hostile environment. Most restaurants fail after about three years, statistically speaking. So when they fail, they are removed from your view. They go away. And all that's left behind are the super successes that skew your information in the direction of survivors. They, these super successful restaurants misrepresent the restaurant business as a whole. So there's another great example of all this. Oh, yes, I remember. Nassim Tlaib has a great quote about restaurants. It's, um, the cemetery of failed restaurants is very silent. So my favorite example, though, has got to be Brad. Hang on a second. Does this guy look like Jeff Bezos to you? This guy. Does he look like Jeff Bezos? <laughs> this is my imagination. <laughs> Eh, a little bit. A little bit. <laughs> Brad Pitt. So let's all think about Brad Pitt for a second. Envision Brad Pitt in your mind. Now, Brad Pitt is um, he's a super successful person. I think all of us... Imagine Brad, Brad Pitt. Pitt. Close your eyes. Profession. Someone that we all know about. Someone that we're all aware of. They're an example of a super successful person who's achieved a great deal, who's very driven, very skilled, and we all know about them because of this. And this is the sort of person that we seek... So this is a Close your eyes. Think from. of Brad Pitt. The kind of person we want to sit down and have an interview with. With these big arms and around. We want to gain from them. We want to pick out of their lives and see what their decisions were, and sort of see if we can gain a measure of success like them. See what their secrets are. But there's a real problem here. As Google engineer Barney B. James says, skill will allow you to place more. I know. Table, but it's not a guarantee of success. 
Because I want you to imagine that the week that Brad Pitt came to Hollywood, thousands of other actors came to Hollywood. I am the spy week, master just now. Just maybe more attractive, just as skilled, maybe more skilled, just as driven, maybe even more driven. But for some variable that they don't even understand themselves, something that they had, uh, some something they could not have anticipated really, they had to move back home, and they will never be asked <laughs> to go inside the actor's studio. They will never be asked for advice on how not to fail, but that is a giant bank of information about how not to fail because they know. Brad Pitt can't give you advice on how not to fail because all of his decisions worked out for him. So as Google engineer Barnaby James adds, uh, beware advice from the successful. See, when you look at all of these magazines that we love to read about successful people that are detailing the Ooh, that's advice that goes against uh, the consensus, isn't it? Be wary advice from successful people. Wow. I guess be wary advice from successful people, but accept advice from experienced people. Stories of their lives. Yeah. Like books yeah. that detail the biographies of a business that has survived. Manpower. Uh, I got lots of manpower, okay? These people look back and they tell Talk you to about, me about my manpower. Right? Really manpower's are. great. You must be careful because they're looking backwards with the clarity of hindsight. And there's a great psychologist. His name is Daniel Kahneman. And he writes about this and he advises us to be very careful that we, when we think about following in the footsteps of these iconic businesses that have these sort of fairy tale existences in our culture, if you're thinking about following the steps of one of these businesses and sort of going one by one through their decisions and mimicking them, he suggests that what you do is at first you go into their history and look at a point when they were just making, when they were just getting by, and see if anyone in that company could anticipate what was going to happen after they made this big decision that we now herald. Yeah, 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 yeah. That's a big factor, isn't it? I, isn't it funny? Okay, so this is called hindsight bias. Oh God, we get we had all the biases today. Is hindsight here? Hindsight. God, it's not even here either. Is it not? Or maybe it has a different name. So hindsight is basically the I saw it all, all <coughs> I saw it all along. I saw it coming all along factor. It's the idea that you make a prediction about something and then for it becomes later true. And you go. I knew it all along. <clears throat> Thank you, dude. 200K. I appreciate that. 200K. The problem is, is you have a tendency to make a lot of predictions on a daily basis. And eventually, just from making predictions and saying something's going to happen, eventually we'll be right. But that's not a very good high percentage rate. If you have a 5% chance of success of making a future prediction, that is not a very high chance of success, is it? That's not something you want to put on a roulette table. That's not something you want to put on the stock market. 5% is incredibly fucking low. My mum, I've noticed, I love my mum to bits, okay? But one thing I will say about it, she does hindsight bias a lot. She says, I saw that coming. I saw it coming. That's, I, see that, I saw that happening coming a miles away. Accident waiting to happen, you know? But the truth is, her success rate is probably something around 5 or 10%. It's pathetic. Now, if you get someone who has, let's say, made a prediction in the past where it really mattered, stock market, crypto, or some other prediction in the future that can make you a lot of money, if they make that prediction, put their money where their mouth is, and then actually make money from that, you can rely on that person. But remember, if they make 10 predictions per day, <laughs> their success rate is probably 1 in 10, you know? So just be aware of that. It's really important that. I feel like I used to fall into that quite often as well. How many achievements do I have? I think I have like half, something like that. I, I'm not particular. I don't find achievement runs very fun. Did they know how the company or, unfold based off of what they were about to do? And he says that you will never see this. It never I don't happens. find them fun or when these people something I find worthy, they're worthwhile. They're in the moment certainty when at the time there was really only chaos. So the great lesson from survivorship bias is that the advice business is a monopoly run by survivors. That means that they can't tell you what you ought not to do, what you shouldn't do. They don't really even know themselves most of the ought time, even though they may feel that way. So if you base all of your knowledge about how to do things off of the super successful, or you pour over books that detail the histories of, of companies that shook the planet, your knowledge of the world will be extremely biased and enormously incomplete because you're not learning about the failures. And you should really pay attention to the failures. Seek them out. See if you can find them. Listen to what they have to say. Because people who have failed are rarely offered money to give advice on how not to fail. They're rarely given the opportunity to speak at a commencement or a high school graduation. And when their knowledge of the world is lost, they become like those bombers that never made it home. Now, one last thing before I leave you, and that is... Uh, to this day, there are still bombers. Bombers' wives and bombers' children waiting for their fathers to come home. F in the chat. 
when I first heard about the story of the bombers, I thought that when I would research and find the true story of the bombers and go through all the information these people left behind, that it would true. be true. Not. In fact, they only started talking about it, these mathematicians and scientists in the 80s. And it surfaced just as anecdotes when they were trying to um, put together an award ceremony posthumously for Abraham Wall. And I've got one convoy. How fascinating that story is and how we can learn <laughs> from it. It's very juicy. I've got one convoy. <laughs> I have no connection to the ocean. It's just stuck in a shipyard somewhere. A uh, shipyard. Warehouse somewhere <laughs> in Prague. And um, we <clears> lost <throat> it to history, which means there are probably so many stories that we could have learned from these numerical soldiers that we'll never know about because they didn't make their way out of the war. They didn't survive. You know, they didn't get into a book or a, or a journal or a magazine. And that's probably true of so many things from the past that are important. You got a river. The past reaches us through. Don't have million, you don't have convoys and rivers in this game, dude. And a great deal is never recorded or is tossed aside by the person holding those filters because they believe that there's really? something that's more interesting or more beautiful or more audacious. All we can ever know about the people who built the world in which we now live, all we can ever learn from history reaches us through stories that, for whatever reason, oh survive. God. Thanks. Woo! Woo! Okay, the final thing we should do with this is just Google survivorship bias just to make sure uh, that we are using the correct definitions of what we've learned. Whether we've packaged together everything we ever learned to actually see if we are actually um, quoting it correctly. Survivorship bias is a logical error of concentrating on people or things that made it past some selection process and overlooking those that did not. Typically, because of the lack of visibility, this can lead to some false conclusions in different, different ways. It is a bomb form of selection bias. I never knew that. We're going to move on. Oh, that's why selection bias is here, isn't it? Where is it? Okay. I guess it's not. I guess it's not. <laughs> okay. I guess selection bias is the second one we can look at. Survivorship bias can lead to overly optimistic beliefs because of fails you are ignored. Oh, those people that go to those self-help seminars. Oh, I feel for them. Such as when the companies are no longer existing are excluded from the analysis of, of, a, of a financial performance. It could also lead to false belief that the successes in a group have some kind of special property rather than just a coincidence. For example, if three of the five students were to be the with the best college grades went to the same high school that can lead to one believe that the high school must offer an excellent education when in fact it may just be the much larger school instead. Yeah, I see what you mean. So basically you're looking at the larger pool of number and you come to the conclusion that is a good number because it's the largest number, but they're all the examples of the successes, not looking at the, the failures. <clears throat> wow. Did we learn something? Did we get big brain?